It's like, I want you to write a letter to yourself as a kid, knowing to think of that age. Like, oh yeah, you know, like, it's okay to like be a weirdo. Like, if you get picked on for that, that's cool. One day those guys are gonna come to your concert. And then I wrote a letter to myself as an adult, but as the eight-year-old self. And I couldn't get through the letter. I mean, I'm bawling, crying. It was just such a great reminder to be a kid at heart. And the best-selling author and host. The number one health and wellness podcast. On Purpose with Jay Shetty. Hey everyone, welcome back to On Purpose, the number one health podcast in the world. Thanks to each and every one of you that come back every week to listen, learn, and grow. Now, I know that you're listening because you want to be happy, you want to be healthy, and you want to be healed. And it's not always that I get to do this, but I try and sit down with guests that I have really deep, meaningful relationships with. And I like to share that with you because I find that when these relationships develop organically offline, then when we bring them online, usually after a couple of years, you get to experience something special. You get to hear two friends talking, you get to hear people not not scared of being interviewed, you get to hear me not being confused or flustered about where I wanna go and I really hope that this interview is gonna do that for you. I'm speaking to someone who needs no introduction. I'm speaking to someone who I absolutely admire and respect on so many levels. You're gonna see that throughout the interview. And I'm speaking to someone who became one of my dearest friends without meeting him during the pandemic. I'm speaking about the one, the only, Joe Jonas, one of the kindest, sweetest, most down-to-earth humans I know. Uh, there is not a bad bone in this guy's body. Uh, he's given me memories that will last a lifetime. I'm so grateful that he's finally on On Purpose. Joe. Wow, thank you. Welcome to what the show. What an intro. It was from the heart. I need you to introduce every show from now on. <laughs> I would do gentlemen, it. Ladies and gentlemen, nicest person I know. Um, <laughs> I'll do it. You, Let Jay. me be the voice of God at your events. <laughs> Please. We have a show tomorrow. You can do it. Um, I'm so thrilled to do this. Yeah. Honestly, your podcast has been on my top listens every week. Um, life-changing and it's interesting how I've quite I'm kind of late to the game I discovered Jay Shetty a bit further along in my meditation journey than most when we first met was via zoom actually the first time we met was in front of like thousands of people online and then we didn't actually meet in person until I probably a year and a half two years later yeah my brother met you twice before. Me. Yeah, <laughs> Nick met you twice. Yeah. Um, so I was quite jealous, and I was like, I'm never, maybe he's not. Maybe he's not real. Maybe this, <laughs> this is an AI version of this person that was created. But um, I'm glad to say you're real. And I'm glad that we've become so close, and you've been um, so helpful for me on my on, on on my personal walk with whether if it's the Jonas Brothers to um, personal things I'm going through that I've expressed with you, and on a bigger scale of just like the days that we live our lives for everyone else and how I'm able to function like a normal human being when I go home at the end of the day. <laughs> so it's been really helpful. So thank you. No, and I, and I want to give you some credit for this because I think a lot of this stuff happens behind the scenes and people are unaware, especially with someone like you. You've been popular and famous for so much of your life. And, you know, there's so much written about people and so much you hear about people and there's so much you don't hear. And I think in my line of work where I get to see the behind the scenes of a lot of people, I, I like to be able to share that because I think it's important. So what Joe's talking about for anyone who's listening or watching back at home is we did this charity event thanks to, and I want to give a big shout out to David Johnson, yeah. right? Because David, David yeah, David Johnson, yeah. Because yeah. David knew that, David felt that we would connect and we did this event for We Day and it was Joe, Lily Collins and myself and Lily and Joe were hosting and I was asked to teach a meditation. And literally seconds after this, meditation finishes live online to thousands of people, I get a message from Joe, like probably I, literally in the next couple of hours, saying, hey, I'd love to do a meditation like that for my friends. And I'm like, cool, that sounds great, let's do it. And I, and I thought nothing of it, I was like, yeah, that makes sense, he obviously enjoyed it, that's great, love that, and so we did it. So we set it up for that Sunday, I think it was a Sunday. Right. And he set up a Zoom link, he sent me a Zoom link, and we started this thing in like maybe I can't remember how many people joined the first one. The first right? one was probably close to like six or seven people. Oh, was it really? Okay, right. I think it was so, pretty intimate. Yeah. If, so, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah. And then cut to, you know, after the first few weeks, more people started to join. And there was always the same 10. But for sure, <laughs> sometimes it was like 30 people were on the Zoom. Yeah. And all different walks of life, people from all over the world. Obviously, when we're in proper lockdown... Um, and a lot of things were happening in the world. 
it was really the best thing to have at, at the end of your week or the beginning of your week to just get together and meditate with people and then have a discussion whether people and you were so kind and you've oh, still we still do this so you're still so kind to take time out of your crazy schedule to answer any questions or even give advice and sometimes it's just an open floor to talk and express how everybody's feeling and it was so helpful for me but it's also i think really been a wonderful experience to give back to all my friends and or at least to be able to present a comfortable place where they can just uh, be themselves and talk about their emotions and not feel embarrassed about it. And it, it's been incredible. Yeah, the impressive part to me, though, was, and obviously you gave me beautiful friends and family and people like Greg and, you know, Vanessa Hudgens has been on the show. I met her through the yeah. Zen Zone. Uh, she talked about how she met Cole I mean, through the Zen Zone. met Cole, her <laughs> boyfriend, her now boyfriend, who played who played for the Pittsburgh Pirates for years and our my good friend Christo invited him Christo, one day. Of course, yeah. So he invited him one day on the Zoom and then, yeah, then Vanessa met Cole through this zoo. Like, so there's yeah. been like romance that's <laughs> come from this, but it's um, it's really special, and I'm yeah. glad that we, we we kept it up. And and obviously everyone's life kind of got back to normal, but we oh, still yeah. wanted to do it. I I saw um, a few people last week, and they were like, "When are we doing it again?" We so have to do it again. We obviously, have to. Uh, it's become like a, a norm for us. Well, that's what I was gonna say. That the impressive part, and I, and now we'll put a bow on the bromance and start getting to an interview. Everyone who's been listening, but. <laughs> The most impressive part is that we did it for 75 weeks. Like I think when I calculated, it was like 75, 85, wow. maybe we even did a few more. And I think it's that level of consistency that I admire in someone like you. Uh, you know, anyone can do one and anyone can be like inspired for a week. But to be inspired and through our conversations, I've continued to see that, like to be inspired and consistent with something for that long and then to inspire a community to do that it requires someone really special. So I, I really am so impressed by that. And it became the model of how I work with so many people where I realized that you taught me that. You were like, hey, just don't make it a one-on-one, -on -one. like bring people along for the journey. And so you, you really inspired wow. me in that way. Thank and, you, my and, I, and anyone who ever asked for a meditation, I started saying to them, make sure you invite your friends because Joe did this thing and it inspired <laughs> me. And, oh, and I so genuinely cool. think it's changed the model of how I work with people. Well, I feel like as well, you know, what... I miss so dearly was just that connection of being around my friends, obviously everyone and family. And I was also getting tired of these like Zoom parties where you're playing games and you're like, all right, uh, this is not happening. This is not working for me anymore. So the idea that you feel on an emotional level, you can connect with people. And also there's a, a accountability of like, you kept your camera on and your audio on so everyone was able to be actually meditating with each other mm. and feel that difference oh, because we know how it usually goes when you're in a zoom meeting or a party like half the time you're hitting the mute button and camera's off and you're, you're doing something <laughs> else or you're on a bicycle while you're doing it so it was nice to be present and do it yeah let's let's uh, get into it yeah. because i really want to i really want people to hear about your journey especially your personal growth journey the journey sure, you've been yeah, through as an amazing husband, a father, like just, you know, this incredible growth journey you've been on. And I think for people who've known you for such a long time, I remember coming to your events last year and you've got all these new young audiences. Then you've got audiences who've been with you for all these years. When did you start realizing you wanted to work on yourself? Like when was that like a idea or a thought, a seed? When did it yeah, start? There was a, there's been a few hurdles that I, I felt like I probably need to take care of myself physically, <laughs> mentally. I think the biggest one that comes to mind, many years ago, I released a solo album. So I did a, a record alongside with my brothers. Um, we kind of all started to feel like we had separate personal interests professionally. And I made an album that I'm really proud of. Now I like it even more than I used to. I think at the time there was a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And when you're like performing at the level that the Jonas Brothers were back when, and you know, it was just chaos and craziness and and number one albums and the song would break records on youtube and things were happening in real time you kind of think like all right this is the norm like this is going to happen for me too and i think that's like obviously a really bizarre thing to even think about but that started to become like oh, okay anything we touch i think it's going to really take off um and i had kind of a wake-up call when i released this album and it didn't perform as well as say the brother stuff and I also forgot that the years and years of hard work that we put into the to the brothers' music to even get to a level where that many people are listening to our songs and 
I took it really hard, but I didn't realize how I actually felt in the moments. I, I figured, oh, okay, well, I'll just get back on the road and, you know, start promoting this. And I, I had like a bit of like a lifespan with this album. I knew that the next Brothers project or TV show or something was right around the corner. So I had about a year and a half to really focus in on this album called Fast Life. And I was, in, I was here in New York um, after the album was out and it didn't really do much and started reading reviews, started seeing the reactions and it hit me like a, a ton of bricks. And I started feeling like physically ill and I really told myself and I believed that I was sick. So I would go to the doctor I started going to the doctor like every other week and then it became like every week. And it was almost like a joke with my friends. We're like, oh, Sunday, fun day. Joe's going to the hospital again to get a checkup. And I would do like full body checkups and look at the doctor and be like, doc, like you got to like, all right, I would do ultrasounds on my stomach. I would, it became a thing where it was comical because I'm like, I'm, I'm a hypochondriac. I'm just, I'm overthinking these symptoms or um, creating this in my mind. And one doctor finally just said to me, they're like, have you thought or spoken to a therapist? And I was like, me? No, why would I, why would I ever need therapy? Life is great. <laughs> and um, it kind of just hit me after I left. And I was like, oh my, like, oh my God, maybe they're right. Like, mm. the, the doctor's like, I have all of your results here from the last like, three visits and you have nothing wrong with you physically. Like, you're, you're in great health. But obviously, there's something going on, and she's like, I'm, "I would think I would. This is what I would suggest." So sure enough, I started seeing somebody, and I was like, "Oh, this is, this is why." Bef- right before that window where I started speaking to somebody, I, I would be, I was here in New York, and I'd go on these bike journeys, and I would ride my bike from like eight in the morning to eight at night, and stop along the way. But it was like an escape for me, and I, I and I wasn't able to look at my phone. I wasn't able to think about. Uh, the album. I was I was just a kind of checking out. So I was like still running away, avoiding the problems. But I thought this was like, oh, this is what I needed. Yeah. The minute I got off the bike, I'm feeling sick again. And wow. so I started talking to a therapist and really dove into all of that pain and trauma that I created for myself. And and it, it was weird that it stemmed from something as simple as like, oh, the album didn't do as well as I thought. Mm-hmm. Which you think like, it's not the biggest deal in the world. But I think in my brain, I... I was pushing myself so hard and I had these expectations really set high. That brought me into the walk of therapy and then the walk of meditation with you. And I mean, that's years and years later, but um, that's how I started kind of saying, okay, I think I need to take care of myself and I'm not this 15-year-old kid anymore that can just run, 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 run and be fine. Yeah, and it's it's amazing actually the other way around too. I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but it's like, you said like, oh, I shouldn't have maybe felt that bad that this solo album didn't do so well. But it's like, how old were you when you did the solo album? It's probably about 21, 22 right. years old. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so it's like, you're still a young, young adult. Yeah, that's what <laughs> Just I mean. Like you're figuring still like, it out, you know? Exactly. And you still, and that's what I wonder. It's almost like going away from something that was a surefire win to try something new and potentially out there and risky and moving away from like a, you know, tried and tested formula yeah. of the brothers actually requires a lot of courage. And most people try and hang on to what's tried and true and would be scared to do what you did. And so I think there's also a lot of like Yeah, it took a long time to come to that realization. Yeah, yeah. You know, those like trend words flash in your brain. Like I saw a headline like, ooh, failure. And I took that word and that was my identity with that album. And years later, I was like, what? I I, I wouldn't even listen to the songs as well. And years later, I started listening to them again and obviously going through the work and realizing that, like you said, yeah, that journey, that leap of faith to actually do something else rather than just be pigeon held to like, this is the comfortable place. This is the breadwinner. I'm good here. Yeah. I was like, all right, I'm taking the leap of faith on my own. And that's a big enough, it doesn't matter who, how many people listen to it, if everybody loved it, hated it, whatever. Yeah, You're yeah. doing it for me. And I lost touch with that. Yeah, but that commitment as well, even at that early age, when when was it you started to see a therapist? It was around that same time, right? 21, yeah, it was 22. about 21, 22. Yeah, like that that commitment to that truly working on yourself in a, in a reflective way, like that's, 
that's a big deal even at, even at that age, like to accept that you need help, then to find help. What was that like for the rest of your family? Like how, how was other people reacting to it? Because I feel like today when people try to seek help, often it's in, and I met your parents, they're absolutely wonderful. I've met your brothers, they're, they're yeah. wonderful. Like, you know, I've met, met all your partners. I don't think I met Kevin's uh, wife, but I've met, you know, yeah, both your partners. You know and, the crew. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know the, I've, I've interacted with the family. And so I'm like, I can imagine that they were positive towards you, but what was it like initially? Like, how does that feel like to your parents? I think, you know, our, our dad has been the most incredible person to go to with pretty much anything. It's I mean, amazing. he was a minister for many years. Then he was our manager for uh, a good amount of years. Then around the same time, he became like dad solely again, which was actually great because we had, I had like my dad to go to about stuff. Um, but, you know, when you start that journey of like seeking outside help, it, it is, I, I think as a parent, it'd be a little bit, it's going to take a, a beat to realize like, oh, you're not the only one that can give advice now. Yeah. <laughs> but also I get it. I, you know, I, I think my parents are really mature in that sense where they respect medical professionals. So I think mm-hmm. if like the person has the the degree to to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. be able to uh, give that advice, then I think that they're going to feel more comfortable. I mean, that there's been people that I think I've gone to for, for advice that my dad was like, uh, I'm going <laughs> to raise my hand and say this is my opinion. I don't know if this is the right person for you, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's find somebody with like a couple of doctorates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. That's good advice. Yeah, no, your parents, your parents are so sweet when I met them. Because it's so easy to so like, wonderful. you know, find anybody. Yeah. Be like, all right, Google the lo- closest therapist or person to, or life coach or whatever it may be. Yeah. But to actually have somebody who knows is, yeah. is key. Yeah. I love what you said, though, about how like, you were like, you know, I had to realize that the brothers had spent all these years building something. And then obviously you were trying to do something on your own. Like, how has your personal creative process changed since then? Like, how have you adapted since the first round of the brothers to doing your own thing to now wow. doing, yeah, like how's, how have you changed that? Well, it's changed quite a bit. I feel like with DNCE, I had, and for those who are listening or watching, I'm in a band as well with my yeah. brothers called DNC. Um, we have a, a song, Cake by the Ocean, was our first song I wrote for the, the band with Justin Tranner. And great song. Thank you. (laughs) Great on stage. And that song and the way it took off actually was the first bit of feeling of, okay, this other style of music that I really love to create, I can also pursue and follow this butterfly and see where it takes me because I can bring this back to the brothers. So I've been able to go on my own and I think grow as a writer and a producer and, and, and creator uh, and have that time and then bring it back. And, I, and it's really great now. We have such respect for our individual ways of writing mm. and producing. And, and when Nick and I wrote our most recent album, we had like two different rooms going. So Nick was writing something with um, somebody and I had another room going. And we kind of like brought the best ofs and then came to the table and said, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I'm thinking. And then we like kind of work together. We used to just argue our way through songwriting sessions or everybody wants the chorus, you know? It's like, oh, I want the chorus. My voice sounds great on this. And we're like, oh, I really want to sing this because I kind of think it relates to something I'm going through more. And that was just like, now it's quite nice that we're meeting each other really at the same place. Um, yeah. You know, we're all fathers. We're all in this great place where like not, it's not like one brother's like trying to find the next yacht party and one's like tucking the kids into bed. It's like we're really actually living the same place in our lives. And that makes a huge difference when it comes to the music, I think. Yeah, yeah. And the new music, it feels that uh, lyrically and we can actually tell this grown up story and, and that's essential. Yeah, that's so exciting to hear actually, to hear about how if you're working in a team when you're in a similar place in life, Often there's a bit more empathy, there's a bit more understanding, Definitely. there's a bit more. I, I think it's it's comparable to like any career path. Yeah. I mean, if if you're writing a film with a, a, a good friend and one wants to write a love story and the other's like, no, I want to write a war film. And that's that's that. There's going to be no love in it. It's like definitely like going to be tough, yeah. you know? And so I think we felt yeah. that when we wrote songs. It'd be like, yeah. one person's going through a heartbreak and the other is like, well, I just started seeing somebody. Yeah. It's like... And I know that's really on the, the romance front, but yeah. the, it, that 
the, those heads butted. Yeah. Also, I've gotten the opportunity in the last couple of years to write music for film and TV. Mm. And I love putting a thinking cap on of somebody else. So playing, a, I'm thinking as the character. Yeah. What would they feel? And what, mo- so everything during the lockdown, I wrote a song for um, an animated film called uh, Rumble. About like wrestling monsters. So, like, <laughs> so putting cool. a, putting on a thinking cap of like, all right, what would they sing about? Yeah. yeah and yeah. then um, just recently wrote a song for the film I shot last year, Devotion. I, the director about six months later asked me if I would be interested in writing the end credit song. So I got to to write with Ryan Tedder and Harv, who wrote. Um, he was a born of the writers on Peaches for Je- Justin Bieber, and um, I got my buddy Khalid a part of the song. Um, and that was a really special experience because I also got to think about what it was like for the main character in the film and his relationship and how it was comparison to my relationship and people that are just away from their families and friends a lot. And just what a, that feeling of you don't have to feel like you're alone. I'm always there for you, whether if it's spiritual or mentally, it takes that mindset. Yeah, I mean, that was a lot of the crew for Devotion. They were the ones that were part of our Zen Zone, right? So yeah, it was cool. Spencer, I, it was really ben, special. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, actors, at least the actors I've run into, meditation is so key on set. I mean, mm. when you're having, even if it's like a split second where you have to get into character and just take a second and get it and be like, all right, where am I? Where did I just come from? And it may sometimes be a little conversation in your own head, and I found it immensely helpful in scenes some of the tools you've given me that um, I keep in my back pocket <laughs> and uh, I use, whether if it's on stage or I'm about to hit a terrible golf shot, I can think about, all right, breathe in four times, hold for <laughs> Yeah, I can't improve that. anyone's golf game. I can't even improve my own, so yeah. that's, yeah. <laughs> like my, my meditation doesn't, someone told me meditation and golf were, Hey man, Alive. there's a book there. Yeah, there's a book there. When I, when I get good at golf. <laughs> but tell me about that transition because I think like, you know, I've seen you on stage, you're a natural performer. I always I always tell you, like, I see these pictures come out and I'm like, dude, you just remind me of Freddie Mercury, oh, who man. I love, Thank right? You. Like who I, I, I love. Like Queen was my favorite band Same. growing up. And and so any footage I've ever seen of watching Freddie Mercury live is just unbelievable. And so that comes very naturally to you. You've done it for a long time. What was it that even gave that shift when I heard you were acting? And because you'd just for everyone to realize too, you'd be on set, like you'd be in all these random locations, then like logging into Zen Zone on your phone and like, but what was what brought that transition about? Like where where did that impetus come from? Or like where did that excitement come from? Yeah, well, when I was much younger, I always wanted to act. I always wanted to, like I always put on a show in our basement. I had the Joe show, it was like a talk show that I put on and imitated uh, late night talk shows. And then there was a popular TV series on Nickelodeon called All That that was like a kid's version mm-hmm. of SNL and I wanted to be a part of that show. I was like, these kids are allowed to be <laughs> wacky and fun on TV. This is amazing. Yeah. Um, and then years later, you know, just doing stuff with Disney, we did Camp Rock mm-hmm. and we always like dabbled in, in film and TV and I, and I had opportunities along the way, but music was always my main focus and that took up a lot of time. And the limited amount of weeks or months of the year that I was making an album or it was a little bit quiet season, we're still like, we're still working. Um, and not until really the lockdown where I saw an opportunity of time and um, started auditioning and having conversations. I had a conversation with JD, the director of Devotion, which I, I, I just straight up told him like, look, I know I'm not the first choice. Um, I, I get that simply because I'm, I'm, I don't have the credits to prove that I can do this, but I will work so hard for you. I'll prove to you that I can do this. And I sent myself a tape in, and it was a life-changing experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm lucky that I'm a part of a film like that, or I should say I'm very grateful that I'm a part of a film like that where I'm surrounded by such great talent. And just soaking it up. I knew day one, showing up on set, Jonathan Majors, who plays Jesse Brown, one of our leads of the film, I mean, he was in character at the table read in his flight suit. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, <laughs> this is real. Yeah. And um, I just felt so excited to just learn. And wow. um, it, it's a bit addictive because when you have somebody that is that in character all the time, it, it rubs off on you. So like yeah. all the other guys, we started dressing in 1950s clothes and then we started like afterwards, I still was shaving every day like they were in the Navy. And I just like, I loved that. 
aspect of it where you really try to dive in. Yeah, and you were working out a lot too, right? Like I swear during that movie, you're like. <laughs> well, all these, I, I'll tell you what, I showed, I showed uh, the day the fitting was, I showed up to set and I saw all these photos, mostly just like shirtless photos of these actors. And I was like, oh, I need to get, I need to get like, <laughs> I thought my two days was was enough. Yeah. I was like, I got it. And they're like looking at their ages. And I was like, man, this guy's like six, seven years younger than me. I was like, all right, I got to keep up with these kids. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it inspired me to like work yeah. out. And we did a lot of military training where we wow. were like, we were doing group runs and, um, you know, just working out on set a lot because yeah. we're just sitting around. And, and I think that's why meditation really came in handy. Working out came in handy on set. Mm-hmm. What they don't tell you about being in these beautiful films is that there's a lot of downtime. Yeah, a lot of waiting around, and, yeah. And if you're not number one or two on the call sheet, then you're probably just hanging out and waiting for them to be like, we need you in the background. <laughs> so um, a lot of time spent, and I was just like, built a little workout. Yeah. Uh, I built a gym in my, the back of my car, essentially, and I just would, and I had a shower, so I would, if I got sweaty, I would just shower in the trailer and then get ready again. And wow. Meditation, I mean, we do a Zen Zones yeah. On set, we would yeah. do these zooms where we did meditation on set, and it was really amazing. Where did that work ethic come from for you? Because that's what I was talking about earlier, right? Like your discipline, your ability to apply your mind, your consistency. Like those things are not always common because, sure. you know, especially when you're being artistic and creative, sometimes you need spontaneity and you sometimes just have like an artistic moment, but you've been able to balance the two. Like, where did that work ethic develop? Like, how early was that? When did that? Was that from parenting? Was that from. The I brothers, th- like, where did that come from? You know, I, I, I chopped some of it up to my par- my parents. Um, yeah, they worked really hard. I mean, I watched, I didn't really click. I mean, my dad, you know, he was very much in debt, putting his energy, focus, money into the brothers when we started. I mean, the guy was like three, four jobs. He was driving every day from New Jersey. He would drive us to the city to record a song, drive us back. I mean, it's like an hour each way if you're lucky and there's no traffic. And then on weekends, he's a minister. It's just like wow. juggling a lot of hats and also catering to like an entire church and yeah. their stuff. Yeah. Um, so some of that. And also I think just when it comes down to it, I just want to keep pushing myself. And I also am so grateful that I get to do what I love for a living every day. I wake up and write a gratitude list. And on that list, it's usually one of the top four things is – I'm grateful that I get to do what I love for a living every single day, especially mm. when there's so many people out there and there's so much music constantly coming out. And on the acting side, there's so many great actors out mm-hmm. there that are constantly you're you're seeing and and to be a part of a film like that or to have music pop up on Spotify, New Music Friday, or wherever it may be. I'm like, I am so immensely grateful that I get to do this and yeah. continue to get to do this. And that makes me want to work even much that much harder because I, I don't want to just say, okay, you know what? The brothers are big enough. We're playing these big venues. We're, we're like, I'll, 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 it's like, great. This is a nice paycheck. I'm, 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 you'll see me every year, guys. It's like, no, I want to like, how do we make this, like how do we make the music better? How do we make, or bigger, a bigger meaning like sonically. And yeah. how do we, um, how do we connect more with our fan base and where they're out in their life because they're growing up with us and they have. And it feels so great when we can look, listen to the music and say, I'm so proud of this because mm-hmm. it connects on so many different points. And I'm more being a part of a film like Devotion, emotionally, a beautiful, true story. Um, and other things that I'm working on, just I try to make sure that I'm really passionate about it. Yeah, yeah. And that comes across. And I love that point you made about your parents. I mean, I think about that often with my parents who were both immigrants. Like my mom moved to London when she was 16 years old, which I can't wow. imagine what that feels like. You know, English is not their first language. And then you're starting out from scratch, like nothing. And then when I was, she was like making us breakfast, me and my sister, dropping us to school, going to work, getting us picked up in the evening, making us dinner, like, you wow. know, just like taking care of us. Like, And I just... I always look at my mom's work ethic and I think that's, I can, I feel that similarity where I'm like, I work this hard because I saw my mom work that hard. A hundred percent. And like humble beginnings, it really is like, I'm really glad the way we grew up. Like, I mean, there was a moment where all four boys are in one bedroom 
And four boys, meaning our youngest at the time was a, the, the youngest brother was yeah. you know, he's a baby. And we're like teenagers and we're starting this band. We'd be, play these big stages and go back and sleep in the same bedroom. And at the time I hated it because I was like, ugh. But it's also now I'm like, that's what made me who I am today. And yeah. I, I think if it was a different situation, I don't know if I would be in the same mindset. Yeah, speaking about that though, like one thing I've noticed with you uh, from the time we have spent together and even with everyone else, whether it's online or offline, it's like you're super grounded. You make everyone feel comfortable around you. Like I remember when we were like hanging out last year in New York and, you know, I, I'm always mindful. I'm like, are you sure you want to go there? Like, you know, is you going to be surrounded by people? And like you were so cool when people came up and, you know, we'd always bump into groups of people who were just happy to say hello to yeah. you. And you've always, you seem very comfortable with obviously you've done it for a long time, but you're very comfortable with people. You're very easy with people. You're very grounded. I, I don't I don't notice ego and arrogance when I talk to you and I talk see how you deal with your team, your friends, everyone in your life, and it's really beautiful to watch. Oh, thank you. And I I I really appreciate that because when I was in the monastery, it was like the most we were trained to believe that the most admirable quality in someone was humility. Like that was seen as like the mm. the crown jewel of all qualities was if someone could be extremely accomplished but be humble. And that doesn't mean that they think they're worthless. It just means that right. they still treat everyone with respect. And I, I see that in you. And so I wonder, was arrogance and ego ever a challenge? Was that ever, or was that just like, obviously we all have it when we're young and it, it goes away? Or was it something that you got more used to with fame? Like how did, you, I just want to hear your story with that because I feel like, yeah, it's just special watching you where you are now and just how effortless it is. It's it's interesting because there's been definitely times <laughs> I feel like I've been um, affected by the feeling of being on stage and feeling larger than life at times. You know, like, mm. this feeling is like you know your only way to put it is like the quarterback that wins the high school football game. Like we're doing it every night on stage. That that energy and yeah, um, people screaming your name. And, yeah, it's just it's trippy, you know. Yeah. And it definitely can affect you and also make you like feel out of touch with reality at times. I am really grateful that I've had two guys to do this with. Mm. Um, brothers keep you pretty accountable and <laughs> humble. And we slapped each other around a lot. I think that uh, humble beginnings was also essential. Like, don't forget where you came from. Mm. And all those things are so easy to just forget. Totally. And just move to LA and get a big house and like, you're retired. I'm yeah. like, whatever, don't talk to me. I'm, I'm, I'm hiding out. And to each their own, I just, um, I still don't know what the ingredient was, but I, th the magic ingredient yeah. was, but I think it's a bunch of different things. And I think also just getting older and like finding my own like happiness outside of the brothers, outside mm. of music, outside of film or TV, mm. just like on my own personal front of being able to you know, a bit of separates church and state in that sense yeah. where it's, it's nice to just have something for myself. And Sophie and I am speaking to her, obviously. Yeah. We, uh, my wife, for those who are, <laughs> don't know what to talk about um, or who I'm talking about, you know, we were very particular with like sharing our relationship. So we, we didn't really post anything about our relationship till like we were engaged. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um, and it was nice for the first time to actually just have something for us, for yeah. me, um, that I didn't feel like I needed to share with the world. And um, I think, you know, she is also keeps me humble and accountable. And yeah. it's um, been amazing to have a partner like her. I wind up my wife all the time <laughs> because <laughs> she's she does the same thing to me. Like my wife keeps me so humble and so grounded. <laughs> right. And so I'll wind her up by saying really egotistic things around <laughs> her all the time just to see how she reacts. And she never takes it as a joke. Like to her, it's like, oh, so you can't too. even joke oh, about being arrogant. I can't look in, in the any... mirror a certain way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can't look in selfies a certain way. If I look at it, she's like, why are you doing that pout? Like, what is wrong oh, with yeah. you? Like, I mean, she, yeah, she'll, she'll tell me straight up. She'll be like, you're not going to wear it with those shoes, right? <laughs> yeah. Quote, like yesterday, I was like, well, I was planning on it, but. <laughs> and there's like, obviously, a, a lot of great things that come from it. I'm, yeah, I'm saying the funny things, thing. but I think it's been really helpful to have outside of brothers, even like accountability when it comes yeah. to fame. Yeah. Having a partner who's like supportive and also uh, trustworthy and and you you know has your back, but also will, will, will keep your head on straight. Yeah, definitely. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think about that all the time that I can't imagine how hard it is to 
create then obviously Sophie has an incredible career herself as well. So it, it, it makes it somewhat more understanding. But I, I, with my life, it's like I met Radhi before everything happened. And so it's been really wonderful to be understood in that way as yeah, well. Like that's there's, incredible. Yeah, there's like a and sense. And it's a challenge yeah. as well. Yeah. Like as you're becoming this amazing influential person and there's so much coming at you to have a support. And obviously she also has an amazing career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also to see you both like do your thing and be so supportive and like, you know, the days you can, you know, of the week that you don't get to see your partner, it's just tough. And yeah. I, so I, now in my life, I just work really hard so I can be home more. Yeah. And um, that's been something I've learned, you know, that I, I enjoy time <laughs> off because... I used to just be like, I have a week off. Oh, I'm, where am I, what city am I going to? And now I'm like, I actually understand why it's nice to just chill. Well, you've got adorable children too to add Thank to. Thank you. So yeah, it's, yeah, um, it's like, just incredibly grateful to be a dad. It's, yeah. It's an amazing feeling. Yeah. What, what do you think you've learned by, first we'll start with being in a relationship. Like, What do you think you learned about yourself or something that you grew by being with Sophie that you didn't have before, like a, a skill, an ability, a mindset, an approach to life. What what came through that relationship with Sophie that it's not some like cute relationship that you just you have. I've had my fun, I've dated before plenty. <laughs> but what what it's just so different with Soph is that uh, that blew me away. It's just like the forgiveness, the the partner the friend that I have, like we're each other's best friends and we grow together. I mean, so mm -hmm. many different amazing experiences that we've had in just five some years. It's mm -hmm. just trippy to us. We're like, whoa, we really have lived a life. And um, uh, it's just been amazing to like, at times save each other. You know, mm -hmm. we've gone through so many heavy things together as a couple and individuals. And to know you have that support no matter what, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love hearing that, man. It's beautiful. And, and yeah, I, I agree with you. There's so many things that you can go on and on about. But yeah, I, I feel the same way. Like when I met Radhi, it's like, I don't think I ever knew what a genuine, like understanding relationship looked like. like Absolutely. I, yeah, like I feel understood. Yeah, I remember there was a big moment in our relationship where we were all, had a rocky phase and... I like called it off and she was understanding and that blew my mind yeah. that somebody could be. I, and <laughs> you that, break up with someone and they understand. And yeah. I panicked and got back with her like right away. <laughs> but it was the That's best. Amazing. It was the, obviously the best decision ever. I was yeah. not the breakup part. That was the dumbest decision. Yeah. But yeah. I realizing like the fact that she would be supportive and I'm not saying I was in the right in any way. I realized that this person is loves me so much that they were willing to put aside their stuff for me. And I'm like, what the, like, how, yeah. how could I ever lose that? Yeah. Um, and that's special. Yeah. It's really special. That's beautiful. What about, what about with the kids? Like becoming a dad, like that's oh, another, man. these are all major life transitions, right? Like going from being with the brothers to then doing your solo thing, then coming to therapy, figuring that out, yeah. then, you know, these are all major life transitions. And I think, I'm I'm not a dad yet, so I'm always intrigued to get sure, get yeah. dad tips. And uh, I mean, Willa joined many many meditations, <laughs> <She did. laughs> many Zen zones, which was very sweet. But like, yeah, what what would you say have been the greatest lessons and that for you the, the or greatest, like the you biggest? Know. Yeah, the biggest, the simplest. Sure, it's the greatest. Reason. I mean, there's so many. I got amazing advice before I became a father. Just before becoming a parent, I I reached out to like my favorite people that are parents and the ones that I really respect how they raise their kids. I had a lot of questions for them, but the biggest question was like, if you can give me one big piece of advice. And almost all of them, and this is, sounds just kind of cliche, but they were just like literally enjoy every moment because it moves wow. by so fast. And I think about my own father and I'm thinking like, you know, he blinks and I'm like, his sons are in his 30s. He's like most of his sons. And it's yeah. just like, and I'm a big kid at heart and I... I'll, like I, I encourage other parents to just be a big kid. Another person mentioned, you know, they watch their son, they watch this, like somebody walk by with their child over a puddle. And that parent was like, no, no, we don't jump in puddles. 
And he was like, I never want to be that parent. I want to be the parent that like explores that. Because you know what? There's plenty of clothes at home you can change into. And like that imagination is so important for, mm. for young kids. Mm. And I had that growing up and I want to be like that. Um, now I understand if you're on your way somewhere fancy, whatever, <laughs> I get there's there's obviously times maybe jumping in the puddles not the always the best, but like the message there is yeah, the imag- yeah. imagination is so key. And the if if I was ever held back from like being wacky and silly and putting a show on for my family or friends in my basement, I wouldn't be where I am today. If mm. I if I didn't love the music, if I didn't if I wasn't allowed to listen to the music that I listened to, and there was a lot of things. And I get it. That, that's a big question. Those are I mean, it's a big comment. I yeah. there are music, there's certain music I didn't get to listen to it growing up. But I will say like I it molded me to who I am today. And I, mm. I think the imagination thing is so key yeah no I, I think that's a beautiful point and it's it's interesting how that's really coming out in child psychology now like everything you're saying i think is true because we're seeing through the research that when kids are too limited or restricted or put into this like rule system of like this is right and this is wrong and this is okay and this isn't like as a child it it definitely limits your understanding i mean i mean i've been actually interviewing a ton of people who wow. are like child trauma experts or people who've like deeply Incredible. studied that area and it aligns with what you're saying. And so it's it's beautiful to hear that. And it's nice to hear that you had it and you're continuing to pass it on. Oh yeah. And I, I think one of the, the most amazing things I've done, and I have it framed at home. This was one of my first experiences in therapy. And the therapist asked me to write a letter to like, essentially they asked me to think about what I see when I, when I'm like, when you, Say okay, and I, I'm no therapist, so excuse me for presenting this. And in a, in a, in a, you probably know this method, but it's like I want you to write a letter to yourself as a kid, and I want you to think of that age. So mm. for me, it was between ages like seven and ten. Mm. Um, and they're like, all right, now like I want you to like look at it. there's an empty chair. They're like, I want you to look at the empty chair and really visualize yourself. Like visualize yourself. Like what are you wearing? How's your hair look? Mm. Are you what are you playing with? Are you like sitting there? Are you are you nervous? Are you distracted? I'm like I can see myself essentially. And then I wrote a letter to myself. And like to my younger self like oh yeah, you know, like maybe don't date this person. <laughs> like whatever. Just like funny little things to even like personal things. Like it's okay to like be a weirdo. Like if you get picked on for that, that's cool. And one day those guys are gonna come to your concert. Like whatever. Like <laughs> just funny things. And then I wrote a letter to myself as an adult, but as the eight year old self. And I couldn't get through the letter. I mean, I'm bawling, crying, trying to write this letter. And I wrote it with my the hand I'm not strong. I'm not very strong with. So I wrote my left hand. So it's really squibbly, uh, like squiggly. And ugh, I have the letter framed in my house. It was just <laughs> such a great reminder to yeah. just to be a kid at heart and to like not be too hard on ourselves yeah. because we're all big kids at the end of the day trying to figure this crazy thing called life out. Yeah, totally. I love that exercise. I think it's such an important one and it's like everyone should definitely do that. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, I found it to be an emotional thing. Some people find it to be a fun and game, but I, I, whatever it is, I I loved it and I passed it on. Yeah. No, I think it's so imp- I think it's so powerful. What are other things that like we've talked about meditation of course and I'd love to know more of your practice now as well, but what are some other habits that you've picked up along the way? It sure. sounds like you're a collector of like Definitely, these Definitely, yeah. You know, like uh, you yeah. Yeah, I I like to think I'm a collector. The gratitude of- list you talked about, sure, you talked yeah. about this ki- this letter to kids, we talked about meditation like what are some of the others? All collections from other people. Um, that that's good. But- uh, I think the most recent, our direct, the director of devotion, JD, right above his monitors, he had, what do you want them to feel? Mm. And I just fell in love with that little quote. And I wrote it on a mirror in the dressing room um, that we traveled with. So it wasn't just writing on some back, <laughs> like left it for everyone. <laughs> some random um, bathroom mirror. <laughs> and that really helps me before I go on to stage. Like, what mm. do I want them to feel? Especially after like a long day. Mm. Let's say your voice is tired, you're mentally drained, or you're like, all right, we're playing the same show. Like, got to find, like, like, what about? And then that always reminds me, I'm like, there's somebody out there, that's their favorite song. Or look for that person. Or if I'm tired, like, these people spend all their day getting ready for today. Like I want them to, like if I went to a concert and I, it takes me a lot to go see a show because I 
I'm like, all right, this has got to be somebody I really want to see. Yeah. You want to see the what you think is like, you want to leave going, that was amazing. Yeah. Like, how do I bring that for them? And same, like, for our director. It's like, what do you want them to feel? And um, it's really powerful. So I, I, I've, I've taken that along the way. Um, my morning routine is, I think, pretty locked in now. My streaks are pretty good on my meditation app. <laughs> so, like, I pretty much wake up and the first thing I do is meditate. Sometimes it's like a, a moving meditation where I'm like, mm-hmm. I can be brushing my teeth or doing something, but I'm like in silence and I'm just kind of walking through the steps. And then I write a gratitude list and it's anywhere from I'm grateful for the beautiful morning, I'm grateful for a cup of coffee that's gonna keep me going, or to like a larger thing, I'm grateful for my health, like yeah. the fact that I get to be able to walk on two feet and, uh, and do this and, and obviously, the list goes on. <laughs> and then I'm working on my Italian, so. <laughs> really? Don't quiz me, but I'm uh, slowly, slowly working on that. What's and the, why Italian specifically? The so movie role? I, we, um, we went to Italy on our honeymoon, mm. and I just did not like that I had to like mm. be, my hands were held by our translator the whole trip. So I'm on this romantic trip, and then I'm like, do you mind asking if they have any more? <laughs> like, and, like, and I'm just like embarrassed, but also yeah. like I took that and was like, I want to go back here yeah. on our own yeah. and like not have to have anybody helping us out. It was like that brought me. And then yeah. just Italy's amazing. Yeah, it is. So I would it love, is, to, I'd yeah. love to learn more. I love that. I, I love what you were saying earlier because I think that mindset for anyone who's performing, anyone who's done this for a long time, like, you know, I think a lot of people... Most, most people who don't know me well don't know that I started speaking on stages and at events when I was 18 years old. Mm. And so I'd done what I'd done for 10 years before anyone cared or knew what sure. it was. And when I, when I hear what you're saying, it's like when you've done it for that long, I, I became more grateful when people actually cared because I was yeah. like, I've been doing this for 10 years and like five people showed up. And so... You know, when you start doing it and more people care and more people are interested, you become more grateful. But there was something beautiful. There was an interview with Vanessa Bryant, uh, Kobe's, Bryant's wife, mm. after he passed away. And she was telling a story. Actually, I think she was giving a speech and she told this conversation that she had with Kobe. And she said that, you know, people always asked Kobe why he played when he was injured. Or a lot of people didn't know that he played when he was injured. But every time I'd ask him why he played when he was injured, he'd said that I'd played because that person has saved up to come and watch one game. And they want me to play in that game. They came to watch me. Unbelievable. And if I don't play, then they won't have got to see me and they may not be able to afford to go to another game ever again. And so I'm going to play even if I'm injured. And every time I think about that, and it's exactly what I heard in the essence of what you were saying, that it's like, people have come here to see us. It's like, what do you want them to feel? Like, when you live in that way, it's like every show becomes, it's your first time, right? It feels that way because it's that person's first time, even if it's not yours. And I think that mindset is so beautiful and so special. And you see it across all these amazing people who, who perform for a living, who are doing this week in, week out. And the fact that you share that, it, it speaks volumes for anyone out there who's wanting a career in this light, whatever it may be, any career that's on stage, you've got to have that in your heart because otherwise it gets really boring, really unfulfilling and really dry really quickly. So anyway, you, you've reminded me of that. No, that's a beautiful uh, story. Yeah, and I had to share it. What a legend he had found strength even when he's injured. injured. It's, just, it's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. But, but I like that. Of what do you want to make people feel? I think that that's such a great way to live. Like you just yeah. given a mantra for life. Like I even know. if you're not a performer. I know, I feel like it's just in general being more present with somebody. I mean, you know, there's, there's times feel like you can't really even bring a lot to the table, literally dinner table. Somebody <laughs> calls you and says, hey, you want to get dinner tonight? And you've been running, running, running. You're like, I don't think I can give you 100% of myself mentally mm. or physically even like just to be in your presence. Like I just... Uh, it's okay to give you the rain check. Some passed on the rain check. Sometimes you're just like, I, I want you to be able to have my full attention, mm-hmm. and um, I try to put that into play more yeah. often. How have you managed to 
keep so many good relationships. Like during this busy career, a hectic career, like it's most people end up becoming lonely and successful, right? And when we did Zen Zone, I got to meet all these wonderful human beings. Yeah. And it wasn't just people in the industry. Like it wasn't like a, I just sent a note out and whoever comes, it was like, these are people that know you and you know. And Definitely. like when we would talk and like, you know, there'd be banter back and forth and you could tell that there was a real relationship. Of course, there's bandmates there. There's, sure, there's yeah. people. But it's like, how have you managed? I'm intrigued by that idea because I think it's less common. And I think it's fascinating that it's not just the amount. First of all, you have a quantity of relationships as well, but they're also quality as well. Like, what did you do to do that? I've had the same kind of friend crew for a long time. Um, I think the older you get, your your friends gets tighter. Mm. Uh, some of which, like you said, I'm lucky that I get to work with some of my friends. I mean, that's sometimes a dangerous game. But exactly, I think we've, yeah. we've worked long enough where we've like yeah. we're still friends, even if we've gone and done different career paths and come back together. But mm -hmm. um, I think it's been essential just to get, I, I think I, I always need FaceTime and I don't mean by FaceTime on the phone. I'm like literally FaceTime with that person um, or people. And I, I, I think it's really important for the relationship and just checking in, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting how somebody gave me this advice years ago when we see our friends like going through something um, we know they're going through they've a loss in the family or a situation that's pretty heavy. And we usually you think like, oh, I don't want to bother them right now. And a lot of people are thinking that more than y you would think. Mm -hmm. And how easy it is to pick up the phone or just shoot a text. Um, I've been trying to implement implement that a little bit more. I'm still not great at it, but I definitely know that like, it's something that I have felt on the other side when I'm going through something kind of heavy and like people might go like, oh, I just want to give them space. Maybe they need, nah, maybe I shouldn't pretend like I know it's, it's like, it's somewhat nice to, to be reached out to or to reach out. That's beautiful, man. And, and I know you do that. I think that's the right, thing. When I, I'm sitting in this interview and the whole time I've been thinking like, this guy actually does everything he's saying he does. And it's, <laughs> I genuinely respect it. It's, well, it's so it. hard to, to really walk your talk. It's so hard to like, really emphasize I you know I, I remember even you know just when when we were traveling together last year for that for a couple of the shows and it was just you know you were going through so many family things as well in between yeah and it's like you were constantly there and available and trying to make sure you know trying to figure it out and like that was what you guys were talking about like you know so you could tell just how much love and how much connection there was there with the, you know, with family. And yeah. when, you, when you look at family, family is obviously such a central pillar to your life, like in every sense of the word, the brothers, your parents, your, your wife, your kids, you know, like the, fa the, the crew family, the team family, like if you had to give not advice, but your reflection on like what keeps family to get together, despite so many differences, despite doing business together, yeah. just like what have you, what have you come up with? Because there, there has to be something that keeps someone after all this time like inspired to keep family together when it and it's not just business right it's more than that i think we learned a while back that if it's just business 24 7 which it was like it would implode which it did we broke up as a band and we wanted pretty much nothing to do with each other for a while and when we decided to get back together as a band, there was a lot of like, all right, we have a lot to work through, and we did. But once we stepped back into this crazy world of, uh, of what we do, we made sure that we tried to take some time just for us mm. as brothers, as a family, like go on trips together. Like let's, let's, not, let's not talk about work. And it's weird because work is also like what we love. Yeah. So music does come up, but there are moments where we're like, let's just – Go ski together. Or let's mm. go play golf. I mean, golf mm. is kind of our, <laughs> it's the one thing I guess we all can relate on. I'm yeah. not, I mean, we just went play golf for Nick's birthday. I mean, this guy can, plays like 36 holes in one day. And then he's like, all right, cool. We're going to do that at 7 a.m. tomorrow. I'm like, buddy, I need a break. <laughs> um, so we, we have hobbies outside of yeah, yeah. work that I think that's essential for us. And even like with our my parents and stuff, like just, hanging out you know yeah. let's, let's 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 challenge each other without talking about business because we're still like in a business with our dad at times we're in and out always like it, 
it always, we can't help ourselves because we all love music. We all love what we do. We love supporting each other. But it is nice to, to say, you know what, let's just not talk about, let's just do something as a family or as friends, as brothers, and keep that relationship healthy as much as we can. Yeah. Joe, you've been so generous with your time. I want everyone who's listening and watching to know that it's currently Friday night and it's 8.24 p.m., uh, Joe's at a busy I'm day. I'm at the best bar in town. I'm to- with Jay Shetty. <laughs> Tomorrow you're performing at Global Citizen. Yeah, which- it's going to be really uh, exciting. Global Citizen at Central Park. Yeah. I've never played the show. And, yeah. I mean, quite the flex. I mean, I, 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 uh, I mean, what a great cause. And I'm getting texts like, you're playing in Central Park tomorrow? I'm yeah. like, maybe. <laughs> but I'm really excited to share the stage with some of these legendary acts. I can always say that I, I, I played a show with Metallica. Yeah. <laughs> Never thought I'd be saying that. Yeah, it's awesome. But no, I'm so grateful for your time. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you really wanted to share or something that was on your heart or mind and you're like, oh, I really want to talk about this, but I didn't you know, um, feel like you did it. We kind of tapped into it a little no, bit on like the daily practices. But yeah. one thing I've recently done was I, find, I kind of stole from Greg over there, um, which has been helpful actually. I like recently deleted social media off my phone. Oh wow! And I didn't it's know been that, like, yeah. and I'll still like download Instagram occasionally just to check in on messages because it's like literally a new email at this yeah. point. But I, it's been nice because I, I just needed the break, and it's been really helpful to be present with my friends and family. And I know there's other ways of doing it. I'm not saying it's bad for you. I mean, there's there's other ways of 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 like setting the alarms and timers. But for me to not even have it on my phone, I'll tell you what, I'm just like so much more <laughs> aware, and the and goes the full circle like. Being present with my friends, I'm just yeah. like way more like in it, which has yeah. been really nice. I love that, man. That's and that's hard. And when the it, when only it, thing I miss is like a couple of funny memes my friends will send me. Other than that, I feel like I'm pretty like aware, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I've been loving all the spontaneous TikToks. Oh yeah, like the the TikTok's been and, a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I'll get back on there eventually. Um, I, I, I love that. I can showcase that person, my wacky personality. Like I got more people coming up to me on the street these days saying I like your TikTok than your music. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. <laughs> I was doing an interview the other day and I'm sat outside having coffee and this young lady came up and she's like, excuse me. And I was like, this is perfect timing. I'm about to do an interview. And yeah. she's like, I love your TikTok. I was like, not what I expected, but I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And then That's the guy was awesome. like, I guess I should ask about your TikTok. That's awesome. I love that, man. No, and I'm glad you shared that. I think it's so important to take these breaks, to, to disconnect, to be present. But we end every interview with the final five. Uh, and these are fast five. So one word to one sentence maximum. Uh, so you've got to be on your toes, which you're very good at. So here are your final five, Joe Jonas. Uh, the first question is, what is the best advice you've ever received? There's a lot. I mean, I think this has been essential for uh, growing up. Our dad always said, live like you're at the bottom, bottom, even if you're at the top. Mm. I'm not saying I'm at the top, and I never was, but I, I, I think I've gotten to a place where I could be feeling myself, <laughs> and that's been, that brought that's you know, a full great circle piece of back advice. to humble beginning conversation. That's a great piece of advice. All right, we've never had that on the show. I love it. Uh, question number two, what's the worst advice you've ever heard? This isn't going to hurt. And then um, I got my first tattoo. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah, that was bad advice. I like that. All right. Question number three. Uh, what's something you used to value that you don't value anymore? And maybe it's just for the time being, but social media. I mean, mm. I, I taking this break, I realized it's really mm. needed for my life. Yeah, yeah. Taking a little time off and just nice to be aware and present. And so I thought that was like yeah. that was 40 minutes of my day in the day just – Scrolling myself to bed, you know, to bed, and being yeah. like, now I'm dreaming about goats laughing on a mountain. Why? <laughs> um, great dream, but you know, it's like yeah. I can just go to bed. It's yeah, quite yeah, nice. it's quite yeah, nice. yeah. It's no, quite it's nice. huge. That's a huge one. Or wake up and not feel like anxiety from yeah. seeing some craziness. It's just nice to be like present yeah. and aware, or being like jealous. You're not somewhere in the world with these people that Absolutely. you that you sometimes see. You're like, okay, I'm with myself or my friends, yeah. people that I love. It's quite nice. That's a beautiful answer, beautiful description. All right, question number four is, how would you define your current purpose? I think to just be open to learning mm. and growing. I think I realize that what I do is really incredible because I can make people feel a certain way mm-hmm. and conduct a crowd in a sense. And I'm one of many but few that get that opportunity. And... Um, 
I know how how great of an opportunity that is. And so yeah. um, I think my purpose is to make people feel yeah. hopefully good. <laughs> <laughs> definitely More good. emotional at times with a yeah, song. Definitely good, definitely good. Uh, fifth and final question. If you could create one law that everyone in the world had to follow, what would it be? Be nicer to everyone. Be nicer to people. Yeah, we definitely need that. We do. We definitely need that. Joe, you're the man. Jay, thank you're thank the you man. so much for doing this, no, man. Thank I'm you. so thank grateful. Thank you so much for like, having me. And, no, I'm so grateful you did this. Um, I know we could go on for days. I know. We could talk for hours. Days. We have a lot. We can, <laughs> this is one of 10. This is, this is the first time. This is just <laughs> the first one. The, yeah, You'll come part, on anytime you want. Yeah, I would yeah. love to. Yeah, yeah. you you got to come on anytime. On. No, I'm so grateful you came on. I wanted to document this chapter of our journey together, too. So that every time we can do it and look back. And yeah, like, watch the little screen and go, yeah. remember when? Yeah. Why was I wearing that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think, <laughs> maybe I'll say that, not you. <laughs> but I love that. Thank you, man. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate Everyone who's been uh, listening and watching back at home, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I think there were so many great insights, exercises, tips from Joe. I want to make sure that you, Joe's not on social media, but you can tag him anyway so that he knows I'll, when he comes back. Somebody will show me. Somebody will show me. <laughs> uh, but please tag Joe and I on TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter, whatever you're using so that we can see what you learned, what you took away, what you're practicing. I hope that you're going to put some of these great insights and tips into practice for yourself. And I hope you got to know Joe a little more deeply and a little more through my lens and through my eyes in the way that I've got to know him. So thank you so much for listening and watching. I hope you shared this with a ton of friends. And a big thank you to Joe and a big thank you to each and every one of you. Thank, thank you, man. You. If you want even more videos just like this one, make sure you subscribe and click on the boxes over here. I'm also excited to let you know that you can now get my book, Think Like a Monk, from thinklikeamonkbook.com. Check below in the description to make sure you order today.